Let us all say amen. I um, am overjoyed to be here this morning. Uh, Brother Mike called me uh, about a week ago. He said, James, he says, uh, could I get you to come to East Foothills and preach in my place? I said, absolutely. I said, but you mean you're not going to be there? He said, no, I'm not going to be there. I said, who's going to be in the amen corner? He said, don't worry. He said, we've got plenty of brothers that will be in the amen corner with you this morning. Amen. Uh, for those that I have not had the privilege of meeting, my name is Brother James Walker, Jr. I am the senior minister of the Emeryville Church of Christ in Emeryville, uh, where I have labored since the age of 13. Amen. Uh, I was blessed to be baptized into Christ uh, November the 4th, 1992, by my father, Brother James Walker, Sr., uh, and I began preaching uh, about nine years old in 1995, amen. Uh, the Lord blessed me to pick up the Bible, and I haven't put it down since, amen. Uh, and this morning, uh, I, I was just overjoyed. I saw one of the books that I grew up with uh, in the back of the pews, and if you all will, would not mind, I would like to, uh, I love to sing, Amen. Uh, and I saw the green book, and I wanted to invite you all to page number 99. Amen. Everybody will be happy over there. Do we all know that one? Amen. Page number 99. If we could to uh, sing a verse or two of page 99, and we will get into our message for this morning. I am uh, overjoyed to have my family with me this morning. Uh, my beautiful wife of 18 years. Amen. Uh, Sister Denise Walker. And, and our, uh, as we say, our newly adopted son, Jeremiah, Jeremiah uh, worships with us at Emeryville, he and his family. And Jeremiah ran away this morning. He said, I'm going with you guys. I don't want to stay home. I'm going with you guys. OK, well, come on, we'll get in the car. So uh, Jeremiah is accompanying us this morning. Uh, so we all want to thank you for such a hearty and wonderful welcome. Amen. Here at the East Foothills Congregation, page number 99. Amen. Verses number one and verses number four. There's a happy land of promise over in the great beyond, where the saved of earth shall soon the glory share. Oh, where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy over there, over where they will be happy over them. Oh, we will shout and sing his praises to the never ending. And everybody will be happy over there. Meet the one who saved us and to kept us by his grace and to brought us to that land so bright and fair. Oh, we will praise his name forever as we look upon his face. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy over there, over there. Well, we will be happy over them. Oh, we will shout and sing his praises to the never ending. And everybody will be happy over there. Amen. Everybody will be happy over there. Recall the words of John the Revelator when he said, I saw a number that no man could number. Of all nations, of all kindreds, of all people. And John says, I asked one of the elders, who are these people? And where did they come from? And he says, sir, thou knowest. He said, ah, these are they that have come out of great tribulation. That have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I want you to know one thing. If you don't remember anything else that I tell you this morning, remember this one thing. To every problem, there is a solution. And Jesus has all the answers. Amen. In John, the sixth chapter, we are uh, overjoyed to be able to find where Jesus is crossing the Sea of Tiberias. And there is a great multitude of people that are following Jesus. But you know, just like I know, that everybody has a reason for doing everything. 
You want to get the kids to do the chores? Usually there's an allowance involved. Usually there are cookies involved. Come on, y'all. Y'all remember being a child. There was some sort of inspiration. There was some motivation. There was something that made you look forward to the obedience. This great multitude of people, they're following Jesus. They're, they're with him, and they've been with him now for three days. People are hungry. There are fathers that are responsible for their wives and their children. They're between a rock and a hard place. Brothers, say amen when you can. Because they are responsible for the well-being of their families. But guess what? They're not working right now. How do I feed my wife and my children? And I'm not working. But I know I'm doing the right thing because I've got my family and we're following the Lord. What are we going to do now? What about the disciples? The disciples are between a rock and a hard place, too. Because the disciples are hungry as well. And this is where all of you come in this morning. The disciples are hungry, but Jesus tells the disciples to feed the people first. That almost sounds unfair, doesn't it? My stomach is growling, but I've got to feed my brother here first to make sure that he eats. And I'm going to watch him eat while my stomach is growling. And I have to be nice about it, too. I have to smile while he's eating. What am I going to do? See, this is the part of discipleship that is not the most enjoyable part if you don't know what to look for. At the same time that all of this is going on, we've got two more disciples that are falling apart, and probably because they're hungry. You know, some of us get hangry. Some of us get hangry. We, we, you know, sometimes we're not too Christianly when we get hungry. Amen. And what happens is Jesus looks up, Jesus sees this multitude, and Jesus says, we're around here. And listen closely to the question that Jesus asked. Jesus said, where is the marketplace nearby where we can buy bread that everybody can eat? Because what Jesus is looking at is I can address the, the spiritual need, no problem, but I need to address the physical need as well. And if I leave the physical need unaddressed, I won't be able to reach them spiritually because they're hungry. Ask any modern day preacher. You don't get very many amens when folks are hungry. When we have afternoon programs, nobody wants to preach last. Why? Everybody's hungry again. But watch this. We have one disciple. One disciple, even though he is following the Lord, and this is what I want you to see, because, see, everybody in the church struggles with their Christianity and their humanity. And this is where every Christian, no matter what level you are on, no matter how long you've been in the church, this is where everybody is going to have a struggle. First thing I want you to know is that it's okay. Because the fact that you're struggling means you're fighting back. Amen, somebody. If you are struggling, you are fighting. Amen. You are putting up a fight. The Bible says if a man be overtaken in a fault, how did he get overtaken in a fault? He quit fighting back. When you stop fighting back, when you stop resisting the devil, that's when Satan overtakes you. So if you're struggling with it, keep struggling. Keep struggling. Keep praying. Keep fighting back. Keep standing for the Lord. Amen. We have one disciple, he's been smitten with what I call a pessimistic spirit. He cannot see the bright side of anything. The first thing that he does is he uses reality to be a pessimist. And what he does is he tells the Lord, he says, Lord, you know what? It, it, it's, it's hopeless, it's pointless, all is lost. You know what? We don't have enough money. To feed all of these people. You're talking about where's the, where's the grocery store? We don't need a grocery store. We need money. 
Then when you know, you know how it goes, when you get one person that kind of, you know, slides off the deep end, then somebody else joins. And so what happens now is another disciple says, well, okay, there is a lad here. There's a small child here. And he has a small child's lunch. He has two small fish. Not just two fish. You know, just to say two fish would have been fine. But he had to say that they're two small fish. Not just five loaves of bread, but he's got five barley loaves. What are you saying, preacher? In other words, I'm saying he had a Lunchable. Mm -hmm. He had a Lunchable and some handy snacks. Y'all remember the handy snacks? They had the little crackers and the cheesy. Yeah, exactly. That's about what he had. It was intended not even to fill the belly of a small child, this was intended to be something to, to hold him over until he could get home. That's what the child had. But do you know what Jesus did and what Jesus teaches us here? It's not about what you have. It's not about how much you have. It's about what you do with what you have. See, that's where faith comes in. Remember, what is faith? Faith is what? The substance the substance is what something is composed of, what it's made out of, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it is what? The evidence of things not seen. So guess what? Faith fills in the gaps for everything that we don't have. So Jesus takes what he has, a lunchable, and Jesus does what with it? Did Jesus try to stretch it? No, he didn't. Did Jesus ask God to add something to it? No, he did not. The Bible says he took what he had and gave thanks. In other words, Jesus took what was insufficient and praised God for what we have. Now, faith can fill in the gaps. Because you are thankful for what you have. And the one child that God will always bless is a thankful child. And as everybody, and I don't know, maybe this is why we bow our heads at the dinner table now. I don't know. Maybe this is the reason. But while they were praying, and they have their heads bowed praying, the food begins to multiply. But remember, we still have doubting disciples. We still have Hungry people, but we've got a loving seed. And now, as the food has multiplied, by the time we all hold our heads up and say amen, what happened to that lunchable? Because now we see hometown buffet. That's a pretty big change. Now, Jesus turns to the disciples. And the title of our message this morning, what about the leftovers? What about the leftovers? This is the test of discipleship. A disciple is a follower and a learner of Jesus. It does you no good to follow if you don't learn anything. And you cannot follow without learning anything. A disciple is a follower and a learner. So let's see, what do we learn when we follow Jesus? Are you ready? The disciples now are to prepare the people for the reception of the blessing. And what I love so much, the, the young brother that read 1 Corinthians 11 this morning, what I love so much is the first words, we're so used to hearing it, in the first, in the phraseology that Paul puts it, Paul says, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. We're used to hearing it, but what happens when we see it? Because that's what we saw in John chapter 6, right? Watch this. Jesus has prayed and gave thanks for the food. God has blessed what they have. Now, guess where it's coming from? It's coming from Jesus to who? To the disciples. And then from the disciples to the people. In other words, for I have received from the Lord that which also 
I delivered unto you. Guess what? The word of God has come the same way. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they were, were moved by the Holy Spirit. John the 16th chapter, John says the same thing. He says, the spirit of truth shall bear witness of me, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he heareth, that shall he also speak. But guess what? The Bible is error proof. Amen. There would be many people in the world, on television, on the radio, on the Internet, especially. They're going to try to tell you, oh, some man wrote the Bible. Guess what? The men who wrote the Bible wrote under God's express consent and instruction. They did not write whatever they wanted to write. It wasn't up to them to just dream up something to write. Amen. They write as they were led. They wrote as they were led by the Holy Spirit. Watch this. We still have disciples who themselves are hungry and in need. But they are now ministering to the people that cannot do for themselves. Jesus says, get the people to sit down. Tell them to get ready to eat. Jesus asked the blessing. Now the food is being distributed to all of those that are sitting down. All of our lives, we have read this scripture. We've always heard Jesus feeds the 5,000. Way more than 5,000 people. The reason why I want to say that, I want you to understand that and remember that is because there are 5,000 men not counting the women and the children. If you add another, let's just say everybody was married. There are 5,000 men. Every man has a wife. Well, that's 10,000 people. Of those 10,000 people, if each family had two children, that would be 20,000 people. Remember, all we had was a Lunchable. That's all we started with. But it's not about what you have. It's about what you do with what God has trusted in your hand. The disciples now are giving the food to the people. And the people not only receive, as the disciples said, a little. Remember, we can only see so much so far. And the issue that, 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 that Andrew and, 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 and the other disciples had, they said, there is not enough that everybody can take a little. Let me tell you something. When Jesus solves a problem, Jesus solves the problem. Jesus solves the problem, the side effects, and everything else that might come along. Because what has happened is the people have been able to not only eat, but they have been able to eat and get full and take as much as they want. And there still are leftovers. Think fast. How many disciples are there? Say it loud. Well, how many baskets of leftover, uneaten, untouched food were gathered up? Twelve baskets. So whereas the test of discipleship was to minister to those while the disciples themselves were in need, their provision had already been made by the Lord because the provision for the disciples was in the Lord's plan to begin with. Being a disciple of the Lord does not mean that you're ever going to be without. It means you may have to say no to some things, but just because you have to say no to some things does not mean that your provision has not already been made because your provision is in God's providence he said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now the disciples have a basket to themselves. Jesus said, gather up the fragments that nothing be lost. That's another thing, being a disciple of the Lord, being a child of God. That's something else that we've got to work on and make sure that we're mindful of wastefulness. Amen. 
We live in a world, we live in a society where when we are just done with something, we just ball it up, throw it in the garbage, and that's just the end of it. Well, I paid for it, right? I mean, come on, that's, that's, that, is, that is the average attitude in society today. Let me tell you something. I was listening to another speaker who had gone to Hawaii. And he said, I, I sat down and I, I saw a homeless man. Homeless man that is in the park watching another man eat a hamburger. The man has eaten as much of this hamburger as he wants. He balls it up in the paper. He throw, puts it back in the bag and throws the bag into the garbage can. He says, and I watched the homeless man as he watched the man eating the hamburger. When he's finished with his hamburger, throws in the trash. The man goes over to the trash. The homeless man pulls the bag out of the garbage. It's not just so much that he pulled it out of the garbage. It's what he did with the garbage. He takes the bag over to the picnic table. He, he, he tears the bag open on the picnic table. He unballs the balled up hamburger. He straightens out the paper and he takes french fries and found a packet of ketchup. Opens the packet of ketchup, puts the ketchup on the french fries. But the most heart touching part is what he does next with the garbage. He folded his hand and ask the blessing for the garbage that he was about to eat. And he thanked God for the garbage that the man threw away. So I ask you, what is wrong with us? When we walk into the supermarket and we say, I don't want this, I don't want that, I don't have a taste for this, I don't have a taste for that, then go home and say, you know, I wish my life was better. Somebody just asked the blessing for garbage and thank God for it, praise God for it, and ate and got full. And we have choices on what we want, what we don't want. Amen, somebody. We, we're, worried about, we're worried about the things that don't even matter. Somebody's thanking God. The same people that witnessed the miracle. This is where things kind of fell apart later in the chapter. The same people that witnessed the miracle. The same people that had been fed. The same people that had followed Jesus for three days. The same people that have witnessed the miracle. The same people that have seen the signs, that have seen the wonders. When Jesus begins to teach, these are the same people that turn their backs on him and they go back home. Funny, nobody wanted to turn their back on Jesus when they were hungry. I did not read not one hungry person returning home because they were hungry. Everybody had faith so long as Jesus gave them what they desired. But when it's our turn to do what God desires, I, I heard a, a, a depressed Jesus. I heard and I felt in my spirit a, a, a sudden Savior with tears falling from his eyes as he looked at the last 12 people. Out of at least 5,000, there are 12 of us left, plus me makes 13. And he says, are you going to go away also? Out of all the people, all the people, where did everybody go? As soon as we opened the Bible, everybody's gone. But when it was time to eat, everybody was there. What happened? Jesus looks up and Jesus asks his disciples, he says, are you going to leave me too? Thank God for Peter. Peter will speak up when nobody else will speak up. And Peter says, Lord, where are we going to go? Where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, where else are we going to go? There is nobody can do what the Lord can do. Nobody can deliver the way the Lord delivers. 
being a follower, being a learner, being a child of God, it is not always going to be peaches and ice cream and sunshine every day. What drives us through the storm, what helps us through the rough time is looking to the other side to see what's motivating us. And let me tell you, my friends and family, what's motivating us is that great city called I remember reading in Revelation, the 21st chapter. He said, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away and there was no more sea. He said, I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. I heard a voice that said unto me, right for these words are true and faithful. A little farther down in the chapter, he says, unto him that overcome. That's your part. That's my part. That's our part. Unto him that overcome. Not him that is overtaken. Unto him that overcome. Not to him that stops fighting. Unto him that overcome. Even when you are down, Jesus has the answer. When the world walks by you and looks down on you, let me remind you of the man on the Jericho Road. You remember the man that fell among thieves? You remember all of the people, I believe it was a preacher in there somewhere in that group that passed right by him and kept going. But thank God for the Good Samaritan. You remember the Good Samaritan? The Good Samaritan put him on his own beast. And you know, I'm not the smartest man in the world, but if I have a beast that I'm riding on and I pick you up off the ground, that means I had to one, get down off the beast and I have to put you on the beast. That means now that I've got to walk because you are the one riding. That's the test of discipleship. That was a hated man that got down off of his beast and walked to carry the man. Amen, somebody? This is a Samaritan man. He's carrying a Jew. Puts him in the inn and says, take care of this man. Not enough. When I come back, I'll pay you whatever I owe you. See, that's somebody that has overcome being hated. And now what he's doing is he's not allowing his feelings of the past to dictate his future. That's something that we're all going to struggle with on the humanity side of Christianity. Because, see, there are some things that, come on, y'all, y'all know just as well as I do, there are some folk that have hurt you. Your problems have had problems. Your issues have had issues. Do not let that dictate your walk with the Lord. Neither height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, or things to come shall separate you from the love of God. Amen. I hope and trust that I've said something this morning from God's holy and divine word that will stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance that we can add and apply to our daily lives. That as we grow in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, we can be better Christians on tomorrow than we have been in the past. Amen. That's the blessing for tomorrow. Amen. Even though tomorrow is not promised, if you receive tomorrow, your blessing is already set. You know why? Because we have another chance to do better today. That's what it's all about. You see, the thing about John 6, you know what John 6 reminds me of? You know why there's so much of me in John 6? Because I'm the fish in the loaf. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. My life is not enough. My goodness is not enough. My intelligence is not enough. My ability is not enough. But Lord, I thank you for what I have. Lord, if you would just bless what I have. That's what Abel did. Abel didn't have enough. I don't even think Abel had a set of instructions. But you know what Abel did? Abel says, if this is not enough, I'm confident that God can make it enough. Or God can prepare it to be enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the absolute best that I can. And do you know that that simple message still speaks volumes today? That's what Hebrews 11 is saying, that even though Abel being dead still speaks, still teaches. How? Because Abel did the best that he could. The Bible says that Abel took of the firstlings of the flock. Abel was the one, hey, message, Abel was the one that taught us about sanctification. 
Abel took the firstlings of the flock. And then of the firstlings of the flock, now that he separated them, he took of the fat thereof. That's called the best of the best. Lord, this is the best that I have to give. Give the Lord your best. I promise you, he will always bless it and take it again. If you are here this morning and you do not share our religious conviction, I want you to know that you are in the right place at the right time. The Bible says that you come to God by hearing the gospel. Acts chapter 15, verses number 7. The Bible says, after there had been much disputing, Peter rose and said, men and brethren, you know a good while ago how God made choice among us. But now by the words of my mouth, you must hear and believe. What do I have to hear? What do I have to believe? You must hear and believe the gospel. I've heard of the gospel. What is the gospel? I'm so glad you asked. The gospel is the saving power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. After you have heard and believed the gospel, which also uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, and by which you are saved. If you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. There it is again. We heard it again. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. You must hear it. You must believe it. After I've heard and believed the gospel, it should do something to me. That should cause a change of mind. That's an eye-opening experience, right? After which, it's time to make some changes. And until I change my mind, nothing else is going to get better. You can have a bad habit. You can be a smoker. You can be a drinker. Whatever the bad habit is, until you change your mind, nothing else is going to change. It's no different with sin. It's no different with salvation. Until you change your mind, nothing else is going to get better. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verses number 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Repenting starts with a change of mind. It is completed through a change of action, but it starts with a change of mind. The same people that were chanting at one time, crucifying, crucifying, crucifying. Let Barabbas go, crucify Jesus. Those same people, the Bible says in Acts 2 and 36 and 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do we do now? Literally, that's what they have. What do we do now? Peter said, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After you repent, you should be willing to confess or acknowledge, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 40, there was a man of Ethiopia that was riding in his chariot, and a church of Christ preacher, thank God, named Philip, came along and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I accept some man should guide me? You know something, whether or not we admit it, that's what many of us have fallen to. We need somebody to help guide us, amen? We need Bible study. Amen, somebody. Attend Bible study. Study your Bible at home. Study with your family. Every opportunity you have, open the Bible. It is not decoration. We put it on the coffee table. We put it in the back window of the car. But we got some beautiful bars. Use it. Open it. Read it. It works. Trust me, it does. But as they're riding in the chariot, he began preaching and teaching Isaiah the 53rd chapter. The eunuch asked, he said, is, is he talking about himself? Or is he talking about somebody else? The Bible says he began at the same passage of scripture and preached unto him Jesus. As they're riding in the chariot, he says, hey, Here's water. Why can't I be baptized? What hinders me from being baptized? Here is water right here. He says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. The Bible says that the Spirit caught away with Philip. The next time we saw Philip, he was somewhere in Samaria, preaching all over again. Amen. 
But the Bible says that the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. It's time for you to go on your way rejoicing. Amen. But the only way that you go on your way rejoicing, you've got to be on your way with the Lord. Without the Lord, there is no rejoicing. Notice the man wasn't rejoicing when Philip came to the chariot. But when they parted ways, there was somebody else in that chariot right with him. Amen. He went on his way rejoicing. If you are here this morning and you are subject to the invitation, maybe you are here this morning and you need prayer. Maybe you've been struggling with something. You're trying to overcome something. Let me tell you something. There is a perfect recipe for healing in the Bible. It says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That thing that you're struggling with is the fault. Amen? We'll get into this another time if the Lord says the same. There's a difference between the fault and the sin. The fault is what causes the sin. Amen? If you heal the fault, you can address the sin, amen? But sometimes we pray and just ask for forgiveness for sin and leave the fault untreated. We're right back next week praying for the same thing because the fault is being unaddressed. Let's pray for one another, amen? Let's pray for one another. Let's help one another. Let's walk with one another. There's a song that says, when you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory it sheds on our way while we do his good will. He abides with us still, and to all who will trust and obey. At this time, let us be standing as we sing the song of encouragement.